So the book is a collection of readings of 17th century texts that really span the whole century. I think the earliest is from 1622 and you go all the way to about 1715, so the long run of the 17th century. And it's a book about how texts negotiate but also generate the norms of gender, um, norms that you show to be very powerful in their effects on subjects and bodies, but which you also show to be fraught with tensions and contradictions. So in speaking about gender, you use the term that appears already in the title, dynamics, and you point out that this is a 17th century term. It's a term coined by Leibniz, um, when he was studying um, the forces that impel emotion, uh, the collision of bodies. <laughs> um, so you're thinking about gender as a process of normativity, negotiation, and resistance, always in a, in a kind of dynamic mode. So the book uh, contains six chapters, and it's divided into two halves. The first half considers uh, men's writing about women, or three texts, or, or um, constellations of texts in which men are writing about women. And the second half uh, is really women writing about women and um, gender. And the texts that you discuss range from the, um, the very canonical, so Racine's Ephigenie, I think would be Exhibit A, right there, to um, the sub-canonical, you, you talk about Madame de Lafayette, but rather than going to the Princesse du Club, you talk about the Princesse de Montpensier. Right. Nobody reads it though. Although there's a there's a, a French film, I think it's very disappointing. disappointing. <laughs> so people will turn to the book. Yes. Uh, and you also talk about a work that I had never heard of, but I found fascinating, called Les Caquets de la Couche, which is about a man eavesdropping on a group of women talking uh, in the context of women's confinement. So he's, he's picking in the alcohol and listening to their, um, their conversations. Um, the book uh, enters into a lot of theoretical conversations. There are very important dialogues with major uh, theoreticians and scholars of uh, literary theory and critical theory. Um, there's a long engagement with Bakhtin, for example, that's, that's very important. Um, but I think perhaps you would agree that the most important conversations that you have are those with Michel Foucault and Judith Butler. So conversations that are about the dynamics of power and resistance, counter discourses, reverse dominant discourses, counter discourses, reverse discourses, and um, the, you know, the relations between sex, gender, and sexuality. So I realized that I'm getting immediately into the crux of the you know, theoretical part of the book. But I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about those conversations and the ways in which you use and redeploy, sometimes question um, the, the ideas of Foucault and uh, First of all, I want to thank Shani, um, who's um, encouragement uh, and welcoming uh, here at the Mesa has really been very important. This is my second uh, appearance, and I'm, I'm delighted to do it. I should mention perhaps my first was something that Antoine Compagnon engineered for returning uh, PhDs here in a series of lectures. So, uh, Antoine. Uh, thanks to, to uh, Madeleine Dobby, who's on sabbatical, and so this is really beyond uh, the call of duty, and I appreciate her generosity. And I'm delighted. Thank you. Um, so, uh, let me just say, first of all, um, as, um, as Shani mentioned, this is definitely um, um, a work where the individual pieces and the thinking that frames it um, is really not an individual thing. I, I think of all the courses that I taught and the lectures and the conferences and the readings that I did, uh, and it's really a kind of reversed onion where just layers keep getting on Get, getting added on as one reads and thinks and interacts uh, with others. So it is certainly a collective work in that, in that sense. Um, to be sure, uh, the um, two principal um, figures, the Compagnon de Route, um, uh, 
are certainly Foucault uh, and Butler, of course, who constantly reads and, and also reworks Foucault. Um, starting with Foucault, it is obvious that uh, Foucault was not interested uh, in gender. Um, and I think feminists have been uh, struggling with that since the part of Foucault uh, that dealt with discipline and power structures and um, confinement, if you will, was suddenly something that could appeal to, to as feminists thought about deconstructing precisely that. Um, gender, as I say, was not a category that interested him, although obviously the topics that come up in History of Sexuality, Volume 1, and specifically the discussion at the end of that volume of the relationship of sex to sexuality um, has been important for, for feminists such as myself in that, you know, originally it was sex to gender as nature as to culture. And what Foucault does is say, wait a second, we have this discourse of sexuality which then constructs sex. And so it turned the whole thing around in ways that I think have been very important. I should also mention, however, there is a moment in the later Foucault, and specifically um, uh, the seminar that he, that's called Society Must Be Defended, where I think for the first time, at least as far as I know, Foucault talks about basically subjugated knowledges and how these emerge um, and this kind of insurrection of subjugated knowledges which were considered um, uh, trivial, uh, irrelevant, and so forth, begin to come to the fore. And I use that as a way of thinking also that, uh, although he didn't go there, one can think about women's studies, gender studies, feminist studies, along those same lines. Having said that, um, I think that I also certainly part company uh, at various moments in this book with uh, Foucault. Um, one, for example, is the instance you mentioned of discourses, counter discourses, or reverse discourses. Because one thing that I found, and it really becomes the topic of, of chapter three in the book, is that he sort of assumed that reverse discourses were also always emancipatory. And it turns out that if you think of these shifting gender norms, you can have reverse discourses that are also reactionary. And then in the case of these two, a, a pedagogical discourse, uh, which is certainly one that he begins to talk about in Discipline and Punish, you could see where, for example, Fénelon, as opposed to Poulain de Baba, could be viewed as a reactionary discourse, on top of which you have to add um, my least favorite person, who's Madame de Nantino, um, Louis XIV's concert, and probably a second way. Um, in any case, so there is a, a, an ongoing discussion with Foucault, um, certainly around the issue of resistance and, and how we think about that. Um, and I try to articulate that sort of through uh, Butler. I'll just come back to that in a second. Uh, and also, finally, in the epilogue, I, I, I look at uh, Foucault's concept of critique, which he articulates in a number of essays. And I conclude that one of the things that's missing in Foucault is the other. Um, he doesn't, except for one moment, it's sort of around 16, 1968, he never talks in terms of critique uh, uh, in relationship to a group that might be critiquing or attempting to make social change in a, in a subverting way to dominant discourses. So would you all like to move in a bit, please? Um, so Foucault is a constant interlocutor and he already contributes to my thinking in ways in which I also uh, depart uh, from him. Um, as for Butler, I think the most important thing, I think Butler has touched really from the beginning, from gender trouble on, I don't mention what Hegel wrote the, the dissertation, but from Hegel on she has dealt with the problematic of constructionism and agency. How do you find agency? How do you do agency? What are the possibilities for it in this kind of constructed post-structuralist vision? And I think that's the central question for many of us. And so I grapple uh, with that. Um, I find in uh, a book called Undoing Gender, which I think is even more important in some ways than gender trouble, um, that she begins to think more historically about gender norms, which is something that I obviously 
it's not presentist as much as some of the other work. Uh, and that is, that is an important thing for me. Uh, but uh, I also uh, think that there's a way in which uh, there are moments when the uh, agency becomes somewhat magical. Uh, and I talk about several passages where it is not clear who is, who is doing. Um, there's a moment uh, I, uh, in one of her uh, books where it seems she says that you pick up the tools that are there. The question is who is picking up the tools? And because she doesn't want a subject that pre-exists this entry into the social or the symbolic, she's sort of stuck trying to articulate it. I try to solve the problem by thinking historically in the early modern period about at any moment the fact that there is a number of types operating, interrelating, uh, shifting um, in this kind of dynamic way that I outline. And in the case of women, for example, uh, there is not only the monster that I, uh, that I look at very uh, concretely, uh, there is uh, female insatiable sexuality uh, as another trope. There's the libertine who is emerging. Um, and then on uh, across and through the widow, who's a problematic figure, on to the good widow who doesn't remarry and somehow regains her chastity in the process, um, as well as the unet femme and finally the saint. So I think one of the things that I'm trying to do is to say, wait a second, we can't just talk about women. Um, there is this uh, multitudin multitudinousness of types at any moment. They're all thinking of, thinking of them as planets, all interrelating and shifting, and then gravity pulls toward each other and away from each other. As indeed, at the same time, the other part of the reason for the structure of the book, I think we cannot talk about women without talking about men. So uh, uh, this issue of how do we work men into this uh, vision, this dynamic vision of gender, seems to me very important. In, in feminist discourse, I fear that often men is kind of this, this fixed category. But in fact, uh, early modern men are also going through rather uh, uh, critical uh, shapes. And, and there are, of course, a plurality of types uh, as well uh, at, in that moment. So I think. We have to think of gender relationally, and it's one of the reasons why the book is divided in two. I think at one point you say that the Courant des Femmes, which is, you know, this is thousands of texts comprising this ongoing debate about the nature and the social role of women, right. should be called the Courant des Femmes et des Hommes. Right? Yeah, because uh, there's no way of thinking of one without the other in, if, they, if we're talking about a relational situation. And so I, I think about some of the crisis, if you will, of masculinity in this period, and whether it's in medical discourse, whether it's the relationship of the state to certain classes, um, specifically the nobility, um, uh, and look at the way in which, to give you what I mean by medical discourses, it's in this period that two things, we're in the middle of the new science of the scientific revolution, two things are discovered. One is the clitoris, which, believe it or not, is very, very disturbing uh, to a model in which women had their organs inside of them, right? They had sort of a penis within that didn't have the heat to come out. That's kind of a model. Now, all of a sudden, you have women, basically, having two organs. Um, it, uh, the, the clitoris, by the way, in medical text is often described as the length of a goose's neck. So it is utterly phantasmatic in its dimensions, and often these hypertrophic... I'm um, trying to imagine a goose's neck. Yes, yeah, <laughs> something hanging down a long way. Uh, but secondly, that these hypertrophic clitorises are identified with African women, uh, invariably. So, uh, but leaving that aside, there's a discovery of the ovary. And this is really a, a huge thing because uh, in many ways it was, uh, the female body was considered the vessel uh, and the male um, semen was supposed to do all the work. Now philosophers, starting with Harvey and Manhoff a little bit later on, are saying, wait a second, all of humanity is in the egg. So the patriarchal privilege 
that was grounded and based on reproduction is now put into question. So these are just you know, one level of, I think, also class issues, professional issues, the creation of the noblesse de robe, uh, which has all sorts of implications for this moment. So you really insist in the book on the importance of historically situated readings of the dynamics of gender. And you point to all of the specificities of 17th century France, some of which you've just touched on. Uh, and there are many others that you discuss in the book that have to do with, you know, of course, uh, you know, the transformation of the aristocracy into two different um, levels. Um, you know, they mentioned the new level, the noblesse de robe, um, the front, the um, minorities of three monarchs and the regencies of powerful women. So there are many different things in addition to the scientific revolution. Absolutely. Do you think then that 17th century France is um, an exceptional um, case, a particularly significant, important case for the analysis of gender dynamics? I'm sitting next to an 18th century specialist with a very important book. So obviously, look, I, I look at this moment, and I hope one of the things that I do is stretch back to the 15th century with the lying in and look really forward with Wollstonecraft and the end of the 18th century. So, you know, there's always these arbitrary um, demarcation points, and they really are arbitrary. You have to, in order to focus, you have to exclude, but it's, it's artificial. I think there is something to be said for this particular moment uh, because of, I think, some misconceptions, uh, including, from my perspective, the notion of absolutism. I think there's an absolutistic impulse, uh, but I think it has also countervailing tendencies which tend to be ignored, um, uh, uh, so too with classicism, which I uh, take exception with Foucault's classical age, uh, among others. So I think, I think this period has really interesting um, phenomena. You mentioned the three regencies. It is unprecedented, and there was never going to be another female region after Anne of Austria. That was really the end. The first one is, is in the 16th century, Catherine de Medici's. But you have to understand that this turns the world upside down. France is the only country that has a Salic law that says never will a woman be on the throne of France. I won't bore you with the background about how this thing got invented called the Salic Law. Um, but in any case, what is true is that uh, it is no coincidence then that you have a lot of iconography around the world upside down, um, not to mention, of course, what is going on in the world of discovery. So uh, there are some interesting particular moments, but I'm sure if a Renaissance person were here, they would tell you that that was very special as well. And my, medievalist colleague always says, oh, come on down, it started in the Middle Ages, if I hear that one more time, right? But I think the, 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 what I try to suggest is that you really do have to look at specificity uh, rather than make generalizations for one thing. And obviously, uh, I think the book indicates that I'm on one side of the essentialist wars and not on the other, that I think all that work about the essence of the feminine is really not really. Uh, I do invoke at one point um, in a guy. Um, um, you know, by the way, neither in a guy, six sous or Christeva, the Trinity as I like to call them, did they ever call themselves feminists. So they were doing something else, very late 60s kind of uh, lyrical, beautiful uh, writing. Uh, but I think that um, this notion of, you know, the woman or the essence of woman is Really not helpful. And, yet, and yet you, the book is divided into uh, three chapters on text by men and three chapters on text by women. So I'm yes. wondering about that decision, right. given that you emphasize precisely the constructed and performed performative nature of gender. Right. Well, uh, as I say, I did, I did think this was a sort of interesting religious to put them up against each other and see if one could see any differences. I mean, the body, the corpus is not large enough to make generalizations. So I think if a more asymptomatic, rather than you know, I make some sort of statistical count of what's going on in the century. Um, 
you know, one of the things that I have to think of since I did uh, divide the book that way for, uh, as a sort of illustrative as this gender, relational gender issue, is um, what is the import of the category of the female author or women? And I do here agree uh, with uh, Judith Butler that indeed it still has enormous explanatory powers, that it serves uh, certain purposes to look at this. But I would also say, and by extension, um, that um, one has to think of woman also as standing in for a certain kind of um, subdominant, if you will, uh, subject. And I, I think as uh, women's studies, gender studies, and other kind of studies, uh, and I would go so far as to suggest that the work on women of color, on transnationality, and so forth, I think there is something to be said about looking at specific cases of otherness. Um, not that they're the same, not that one can replace, but I think there's a way in which it becomes an emblem of oppositional readings, if you will, about uh, a, uh, women who uh, have been subdominant uh, in terms of gender norms. But uh, the other thing that I feel strongly about is that we can't be blind, um, uh, that one has to think of intersectionality. And there are moments in which, if you think of um, gender, race, class, that you cannot say at every moment uh, the white woman trumps of the other categories. And uh, I, I think that that is something that's been a blind spot, I may say so in some uh, feminist work. Uh, but I think that there's a way in which um, work uh, on women also can inform other ways of looking at other minority populations or other forms of alterity. Maybe we should uh, become less abstract and, and kind of zoom in a little bit on one of your readings. So I thought perhaps it would be helpful to talk about the, the reading that you do of the most canonical text that everybody in here will be. Well, that was the myth, because they don't have Right, so, so Hassin's Iphigenia exactly is what I have in mind. So obviously, this is a text that is you know, held up as an example, an exemplar of canonicity. French classicism. Um, many readings have been offered. So, what is it that you try to do in your reading? Or will be reading Hassin, or Hassin and his, his commentators? Right. Because the other thing that I try to do in the book is also look at history of criticism in each case of each one of these texts. And in the case of Hassin, one of the things that's interesting, and that is that he here, is, here we go with binary thinking again that he has been labeled as uh, the feminine uh, in contrast to Gomez, the masculine. So uh, Racine was cast as the one who could touch this new kind of a sensibility, emotional sensibility, as opposed to uh, Corneille, who was supposed to be honor and valor and military and so forth. Now mind you, the cabals, <laughs> um, there was a Corneille cabal who wanted to do Racine, and so he could get into the weeds of that. But so I wanted to see what it is that was meant by this. And, and it goes on until today. People are still saying feminine sensibility in Racine. What I discovered reading this particular uh, play is that, first of all, we have to understand it was commissioned. It was the most popular uh, uh, of Racine's <laughs> plays. Uh, there are lots of descriptions how the court was weeping and carrying on. Uh, when they saw this production. So I was interested in what it was that actually uh, struck uh, uh, such, a, such a chord. And one of the things that, that in particular struck me, and that is that Racine in his preface, given his own exigencies not to deviate from classical text, says, so this is the same, we have the same sensibilities, the same taste as classical tragedy, and so, uh, that's it, it's the same. And then you look at the changes that he made. And the, the, the important change that he made was he invented this character, whose name is Erifil, and I do a long etymological study of Erifil as connected to Eris, the goddess of discourse, and a lot of other 
thing. And it turns out that then she becomes iphigenized, not killed, in this particular murder. Uh, but he, uh, Asim has to find a scapegoat, uh, I believe. So the scapegoat he finds is Erisiu, who turns out to be, hypothetically, Helen's daughter, Helen of Troy's daughter. So it's Asiatic already. It's the East, if you will. And she is cast as the bad woman in contrast to good Iphigenia. So the question is, what is this bad woman? Well, it calls out to be the desiring woman, the sexual woman, uh, the one who has uncontrollable desires. And again, this is associated with the sensuous East, if you will, as Troy often is. Uh, and ultimately, that she is the one who is supposed to become, be sacrificed. Um, and at the ending of the play, uh, it looks like the Glorious have come and the Greeks are going to go on to Troy. The ending is very spurious for, I think, several reasons. But one of the things that really interested me, and that is this business about sending the Greeks to Troy, there's a long passage that Ulysses in the play points out that they're doing this to protect, um, right, uh, the uh, hero who's, uh, whose wife has, has gone off with Paris. And then indeed he says, and we, cre we came together, we formed a state to protect those interests, namely monogamy of women. So the idea that the state, the male bonded state, is very striking in the text, is predicated on the control of female sexuality, I thought was a really interesting thing. Um, and goes along with the book of Carol Pateman's, uh, who talks about the sexual contract and the sexual rights of men. Um, and secondly, um, I read the ending differently. I see Erifil as a Phygenias double, uh, since she, after all, she too is related to Helen, and that um, she has become the ultimate subject to the king, uh, not tragic. She really has no agency. She's just this adoring, enlarged and narrow for Agamemnon. She's, she's the good daughter. She's the good daughter. And that you, you, you have to punish the bad, desiring daughter and say, but in the end, I think they're not so different, that this binary of the good, bad woman collapses. And then in some ways, Iphigenia too has been sacrificed, or a part of her has been sacrificed, if you will. So that was sort of my little reading um, of it. Um, I don't think all uh, us and specialists would agree with that reading, but I'm going to read this text base. Mm -hmm. I think several of your chapters take a similar form where you show a potential reading of closure that goes and lines up with the notion of the affirmation of the classical body, let's right. say, or um, the gendered version of the, you know, for so your readings on one level seem to confirm this classical movement towards order and closure and symmetry, the state, the, you know, the, the, the father and so on. But then you pull out the threads <laughs> that are left dangling right, um, in these plots that have to do, in, in this case, for example, with the ultimate fate of the Greeks who um, you know, come to um, harm in the mer, in the sea, mother. Oh, yeah, mer, right. And it's a kind of writing beyond the ending because Asim could assume that people would know what happened to the Greeks when they got to Troy. So it, it does sort of unravel. Um, it's interesting you brought up this, the classical body because I confronted um, in, in the first chapter with this guy who's melancholic and comes to be cured by listening to what women say when there's no men in the room, but that's what that cover is also by the engraver of um, who did this, the title of this is Les Femmes à Table en l'absence de, de leur mari. So it's women in the absence of, of men, if you will, um, gathering together. But I was very interested in the trope of the classical body that's been around now for well over 40 years. Um, and uh, you know, Foucault does it, Elias does it, and of course, Bactine does it. And in this, in this first chapter, I look at how Bactine, that's how I, by the way, heard about these Pecate Lacouchet, it was from Bactine's 
uh, rather than a book. Um, and I think he misreads uh, the Kake. He closes everything down. Um, and I try to say uh, that uh, not only is it not closed down, but in fact, uh, the issue of the bodily, um, uh, because in fact, there's a description of the afterbirth um, uh, and the fact that this uh, guy ends up calling basically his text a placental text, right? So the text that he produces, the sort of uh, uh, afterbirth from the mother, um, is indeed what constitutes his success. So Bakhtin's reading is that this is the post-revelation world I'm reading to the classical body right. and the secret alcohol of the closed eyes. So the, the narrator, the man spying on the woman, frames the disorderly body. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. And also female disorder, which is another theme that runs throughout the book. Mm -hmm. This notion that women are always cast as the disorderly, I mean, witches, for example. Period, um, uh, and so forth. And I, I read uh, this, this text as actually opening the question, right, which is the dominant, which is the counter-dominant, the reverse discourse as far as the body is concerned. Body seems pretty open to me um, in this text, and how uh, Hable, uh, uh, sorry, Bactine was impelled to close off this body, which seems to me uh, indeed quite open. And what was the investment in that? What work did that notion of a closed classical body uh, do for critics these past 40 years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. Um, having zoomed in a little bit on a couple of your readings, I'd, I'd like to zoom out and ask a, a big picture question uh, that, that really you know, is all over this book, but also goes beyond this book into your, your whole career as a, a scholar of, of gender literature uh, and ask you a little bit about you know how, how you see um, sh shifts in the field um, you know, during your period of practice um, how you see the relationship between gender studies today in the US and in France as someone who works across both contexts uh, I know this is a huge question <laughs> Well, I try to do it because I do also want to open up very angry. But so here's what I would say. I think one of the interesting things about women's studies and gender studies, feminist studies, whatever you want to call them, um, because it keeps shifting, is the degree to which it has been an incredibly, again, dynamic field. Um, but uh, what I wanted to say is, so if you think about um, this kind of uh, arc uh, from, let's say, 1970 to today, uh, you see at various moments uh, other discourse, insurrectionist discourse, coming and saying, wait a second, you know, as Christy Bruss says, that's not it, that's still not it. And indeed, I think in, in women's studies, um, the, you know, one of the key ones was women of color, who suddenly said, wait a second, all this stuff about, you know, women working, you've got to be kidding, right? Um, women of color have worked all their lives, and began to really insist that feminists, um, white feminists, start to rethink what they have been saying and the way in which they've been thinking of the feminist enterprise. So then you move that along, and indeed, um, uh, uh, when you think of other, the sex wars that occur, uh, then, for example, the post-colonial transnational moment. And frankly, right now, I think a really interesting thing um, is um, the shift away from a binary notion of gender. Transgender is here to stay, and I think one of the, uh, I went to Wellesley, by the way, you saw, <laughs> I mean, I did go to Wellesley as my undergraduate, saw the cover of the New York Times, um, which asks, uh, what does a women's college mean today because of the whole presence of transgender students? But I think more importantly, and here again, Butler in Undoing Gender has an early piece on, on this, these issues of the transgender. I think it's going to mean that we're going to get um, more and more away from a binary view of gender. I think sometimes that uh, gender is going to become a continuum, or is already a continuum, and people will decide where in that continuum 
they wish to get on or get off. I don't mean like it's a free trip on some bus or something. Uh, these are you know, enormously complicated issues. But that there's going to be a continuum and that we, need, we will need to get away from this, uh, you know, the two doors that I've all spoken about, either the male door or the female door. Well, there's more doors now to the bathrooms, right, than just the male and the female. So I think we have to think about this really paradigm, I hate the term, but you know what I mean, really consequential shift that we're living through, and we really do not know where it's going to end. Um, which has been the source of a lot of contention lately in, in France, particularly. Um, I think so, we actually yeah, have a, a slide. Two, right? We said to this a couple of We have exchanged slides on this, this point, which has to do with the status of gender theory and yeah. so debates about contested nature of gender theory. And, oh, wait, I think you just lost it. Oh, gender, c'est pas mon genre. And do you have the other one? Mm -hmm. Here it is. Now, if you notice, this is one of these magnifiques pour tous. There are either 100,000 or 700,000. Notice the thing on the corner. Non à la théorie du genre. So, I think this, to me it's interesting. Um, this is no to gender theory. <laughs> um, to me, what's interesting is. Why now? I mean, uh, I suddenly realized the other day that in 1980, I wrote a piece for a journal, uh, for a, a book that Columbia published called The Future of Difference, and mine is called The Fernical American Disconnection. Um, I was I was thinking that spaghetti's a must have been, or else I would have been Fernical American um, spaghetti. But this was actually this Fernical American Disconnection. I think there has been this disconnection for very um, complex reasons, uh, one being a Republican subject, uh, which means that people from elsewhere are supposed to assimilate uh, an opposition, at the very least, to what they think of as American tribalism, right, everyone's in their tribe, uh, and many, many other reasons. What interests me is why now? Right? What is it that set this off and in which it got displaced onto gender theory. Now, to be sure, Butler, it took 25 years to translate Butler. So some of that may have, and she's been interpolated into this uh, conversation. But you know, maybe some of you have some thoughts about this, but it seems to me that it's got to be doing work for a lot of larger issues. One has to do with this issue of the family. What is it? Uh, and, and which, which is the immediate context for this particular course. set of slogans and images. So the, the Manif pour tous being the coalition of groups that oppose le mariage pour tous, so it's everyone against everyone, is that right? right. right. And you know, when we had this conversation, you were suggesting that there some traditional conservatives, the church got involved, and so forth. But I guess the other question um, is théorie du genre, really? Now, it is true that there was this thing about the schools, right? They were supposed to teach gender as construction. Look, la, la loi Taubira, is that right? No. High school. High school. High school. High school biology. High school biology. And in fact, I think that the La Manif pour tous have uh, instituted a program called Vigi Gender that parallels Nicolas Sarkozy's Vigi Pirate counterterrorism <laughs> program. So it's counterterrorism and counter gender studies in the same plane of danger to the state. I, I would also venture, and then really, I mean, it's up for grass, you know, at any particular moment, how do we know all the things that something stands for? But I would also think it stands for the anxiety about America. Mm -hmm. Gender is considered, a, you know, this whole thing is about America. Um, and all, I think that there was, I remember the, the huge outcry with uh, marriage equality in France, so this is not new. Uh, but I, uh, Eric Fassin has written quite uh, impressively about this issue of the American scarecrow. You can always hold up the American scarecrow, uh, which has both a phobic and then a kind of emulatory. It's a very complex relationship. 
Serge Gavronsky wrote a book about, right? The <laughs> images of, uh, of America and France uh, some years ago. So I think it's very complicated, but clearly this issue of gender is very contested at this point. So maybe we should, um, at this point, open, a, open our conversation mm -hmm. uh, up and see if there are other uh, people who want to ask questions about the book, about your gender studies, or transatlantic. Serge, you want to tell us about the book? <laughs> Certainly not. Okay. Your talk is English. Oh, thanks. Really. Two micro questions. How do you go from Jansenism and Jackson. Jacqueline mm -hmm. to uh, Diderot's Convent? And what happens in the interpretation of how the woman is treated within Jansenism and thereafter, at least in part, in Catholicism? Well, let me also say, since gender gets displaced on a lot of things, Jansenism was coded as feminine, mm -hmm. because there are all of these women around. Um, as I'm sure most people here know, these uh, 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 Catholic sects were really under assault, not only Jansenism, but also mysticism, and mm -hmm. you know, up in this titanic battle with Fénelon and, and Bossuet and so forth. You know, it's an interesting moment for uh, women religious, uh, the 17th century, because um, they become teaching orders with great um, resistance on the part of the church, but they do begin to become uh, these teaching orders and the abbesses. I mean, some people think the 17th century is the great century of the abbesses. Um, uh, and the question is by, not to say that uh, there weren't, I mean, that, again, there's such a range of, <clears throat> of uh, positions uh, among Catholics in this period, I talk a lot about the Christian moralists <clears throat> who keep trying to accommodate to new social and political conditions around the Regency, for example, um, and who appropriate, but you know, basically for them it still uh, remains uh, very fundamental to turn women away from the public space of the cell, for example, and back into the domestic realm of maternalism. But what I think is uh, for women religious, Again, my medievalist colleague would say, but come on, it starts in the medieval period. But it is a very interesting moment of, of female convents becoming right, teaching orders. Um, and uh, because, of course, female literacy is enormous uh, during this period. <clears throat> what happens by the time of Diderot is, of course, a different question. Maybe one <laughs> that men would like to tell. I don't know if I, I would want to try to answer what happens to you know to gender between Jansenism and Diderot's convent um, specifically. That's it's a daunting question. Um, but there is a kind of I think lack of positivity, if you will, in the 18th century about right convents, which is not so much the case in the 17th. I think I mean the La Religieuse is such a complicated exploration of gender and sexuality that, yes, yeah, so on one level, clearly this is a very negative view of, of the convent, but so much more is at stake there at the same time that I, I wouldn't want to say it was a positive opening for you know, the women religious in the 17th century and the, um, the heads of t teaching orders, uh, and then in the 18th century, we end up with the closure of you know, yeah, the I mean, that is a narrative, but I think there's more, there are more layers to it than, than that. And let me also say that one of the things Elizabeth Rapley has worked on this very, uh, on the devote, as she calls them, uh, in which she shows that they were trying to also impose rules of closure, closure, uh, much more stringently as the century goes on. So I'm not going to say that the abbesses were just having a high old time. Uh, it's complicated. But they do suddenly have this, uh, this pedagogical function that they did not have earlier. They keep pushing up against the confines of the church sets for what they can teach 
influence of Cartesianism for Cartesianism for gender, especially for people like Gabriel Souchon. Um, I don't know if you've ever read Madame de Prangy, or Prangy, however you pronounce that. Right. But a lot of the, the possibilities of an esprit sans corps and, and sort of the influence of that um, for these early sort of proto feminists who have a very odd relationship to feminism because for them the possibility of feminism is a religious possibility, which we don't associate with. Right. How do you know about Souchon? I don't know about Frangy, but I play your a little bit, and I've read okay. some and some Well, the, the issue of Descartes is really interesting. Um, because uh, on the one hand, you know, he has this um, uh, line at the, um, at the beginning of the Discourse on Method. I tend to read it ironically where he says that the bon sens, good, good sense or common sense, is universally distributed. Um, However, his opposition to scholasticism, uh, his taking on in the discourse of institutions of knowledge, um, made him uh, be cast, or cast himself, among the moderns in the century-long debate between the ancients and the moderns. There were, in fact, um, women, his niece, for example, um, who were part of a coterie that my friend Erica Hart is called Cartesian women. So they see him as empowering women, uh, doing that double thing of uh, assaulting uh, the male dominated bastions and at the same time opening the door for women. Um, now, there have been a lot of negative things written about Descartes. There was a stage of sort of body feminism, uh, boredom is perhaps the main example, who thought everything that was wrong about our bodies uh, was caused by Descartes because of the dualism. Uh, there's been another turn recently which is really interesting. People started reading the later Descartes, uh, especially his uh, relationship with Elizabeth of Bohemia. Um, uh, and it's a really interesting, uh, she's the woman, but he's the bourgeois scholar who needs her protection. So the, the dynamics are really quite complicated there. In any case, I think there are people, uh, a former student of mine, um, named Rebecca Wilkin, has written a very nice book that features a kind of rereading of Descartes. Um, and the thought there being that actually she had a tremendous impact on this body mind thing. Um, and argues that uh, the mind affects the body, the body affects the mind. And some people think that in terms of the ethic that he really never wrote, the, the last works are very much influenced by his relationship to Elizabeth. All of this to say that it's a, you know, it's a complicated case, uh, but certainly Descartes, who was vilified by the faculty at the Sorbonne and was not allowed to be taught um, for a long time, seem to be on the side of the moderns, despite he said some pretty nasty things about women, too. And he hoped that even women could read what he wrote. And that's one of the reasons he wrote in, in French, right, and not in, in Latin. To be it, it, okay, that's what I understood in one of his uh, letters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think if you look, especially the fifth part or sixth part of the discourse, where he's reaching out to invite other people to join him, he was also selling, you know, um, trying to find patrons for his scientific experiments. I read the discourse very much as an autobiography, a kind of autobiographical quest. Um, not. Thank you for the question. Could we turn to the French? I'm just wondering if there are people here who have views about the manif pour tous and the hostility to gender theory. Are you all familiar with it? Have you heard of that? You're shaking your head. Oh, no, no. I know the general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you were around Lyon de Belfort, for example, every year, there is a gigantic representation of men coming from Germany and Holland and obviously the French. Presumably, that's an answer against the dominant feminist uh, ideology. Uh, it's a once a year experience, but when I see 
that group. Unavoidably, Parisians love such groupings as of the revolution and perhaps way before. So there sure. are uh, crowds and crowds. There, I think that one group involves, I mean, just on those lines, is the, the Printemps Francais. You know, it's another mm -hmm. group that's broken off, I guess, from the Manif Portus, but that has similar anti mariage Portus, anti um, and anti gender theory views. I saw Anna, I know that this is something she works on, so maybe she'd like to. Um, yeah, I'm just, uh, this is something I'm thinking about a lot this week, because I'm in the process of reading about this for Professor Sada's course. Um, but I'm just, I'm just wondering uh, mainly about, I mean, it's, it's unusual and striking that there is a no to gender theory, you know, banner at a uh, many Yeah. Um, event, uh, as it were. Uh, and I was just wondering, I mean, is that just, is the no to both of those things simultaneously? I mean, you mentioned the pulling the anti-Americanism sort of card. Is that really all there is to that? Or like, what is the link there for people, I'm wondering, and how to articulate that link, really, apart from just kind of a blanket uh, anti-Americanism? Well, look, I mean, the other thing to say here, and we're not saying that I will in a moment, I mean, there's a series of autonomies, right? Feminism is uh, American. Uh, uh, gender, therefore, is American. All this theorizing, which is, of course, based on French theory, one might point out, uh, is also somehow uh, American. The underbelly of that is, frankly, the geopolitical. Um, and everyone keeps talking about, right, this sort of malaise en France. I'm sure the okay, long regime has not helped that malaise. But I wonder to what extent this kind of phobic uh, response or sense about America is not coupled at another level with how come you've got to be the superpower and we are not. I mean, I just wonder geopolitically how much of it is attraction, repulsion, um, things operating. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, uh, the money portraits I know has put out a, um, you know, a booklet that is titled, I think, Idéologie du genre. So the idea is that gender theory is an ideology that is being imposed on school children, and so the Vichy gender program that parents should be warned about this and should resist. Um, and central to this booklet is the idea that gender theory attacks stable notions of the male and female grounded in Body, to come back to the Cartesian discussion and the fact that the bi biology, well, the, the you know the the idea of you know marriage between male and female and parenting between ma male and female flow from this this kind of security or this foundation of um, you know sexed bodies is I know it's central to that um, to that pamphlet. I think my recollection is that um, America is. Amer the American roots of gender theory are referenced in the booklet, but my suspicion is that many other things are, you know, at work. I think also maybe we ought not to, um, you know, this is one current of, of, you know, in France at the moment, but there are many others. Um, if there's a lot of anti-gender theory, it probably means there's also a lot of gender theory. Well, I was going to ask is I I tried I don't know. See, I did find, uh, and actually I knew about Paris Set, but also Paris Reed has got an active uh, MA PhD program. May I say that one of the uh, animatrices there is Anne Berger, who of course has a dual appointment with Cornell, and so that I don't think that's uh, an accident. And I saw that their visiting professor this spring is Rosie Braidotti, who's up in Utrecht and uh, steeped in uh, American. Mm -hmm. Theory, but also European theory. Yes, it seems to me that the, the American reference has um, faded a little. Seems to me that in the you know 90s and 2000s in France, it was this the issue of gender and, and discussions around gender were really constructed in the context of multiculturalism in you know some kind of um, um, agonistic relation to uh, to the US or to you know American 
politics in a way. But it seems to me that we debate sometimes with the past and later with the Bangladesh issues. It has shifted to, I would say, more kind of indigenous uh, discussion about, um, about family, about nature very much here. It's, you know, the, 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 the speaking about gender as something that is constructed. Uh, through power relation is something that is not natural, and so mm -hmm. the reference is nature in terms of biological nature, psychological nature, but you know, reference to Lacan and to nature. I mean, there also was this in the past, still there, going on. And what is to me very interesting is that this debate on the Latin du genre as you know, something that is not natural was prominent in. Uh, uh, debates around the management just recently, last year, in 2014, things have shifted somewhat. So you have the Ministry of, of Education that uh, imposed something called the ABCD de l'égalité, which were you know programs to teach gender equality and issues of you know issues of, of equality in uh, elementary schools, and this provoked uh, strikes, parent strikes. So there were parents who said, "No, we can't. We don't want to send." Pretty, I mean, I'm doing that with my students. It's a subject of class tomorrow. Um, uh, uh, from you know, uh, from you know, thing that seems pretty uh, obvious, like you know, girls don't have to wear skirts. I mean, that I say they're really basic things. Uh, you know, the, you, the boy and play with a doll or something like that. Things addressed to elementary school kids that have you know been turned into a. Uh, a Spacious and dangerous uh, invasion of, 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 of la théorie de genre in school, like something that is going to destroy French. And it's fascinating to see that. So you have you have parents not sending their kids to school if they were uh, in France because of that. It's, it's, it's you know something to be. And here the, the American uh, is, is, is not, not so important. So so there is also connected to this a language of democracy. So yes. one of the many book two slides of thought is gender theory against democracy. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah, it was because it's imposed. It's from the top, it's imposed by Hollande. From the top or from the outside? From, from, the, from top. the top. Yeah, yeah. More than from the outside. You know, the social design is something that prevents us from speaking. Right. Hollande yeah. and Tobira. Yeah. Yeah. Tobira. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Antoine so, wanted also to. I wanted to say something that I couldn't hear what Emmanuel was saying, but it's, it might be the same thing, sorry. Uh, but the, the American reference shouldn't be overestimated in the debate on Théorie du Jean. It really became a household uh, expression in the, in the beginning of uh, 2013 on a school program issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a, a specific manual which was uh, which was supposed to be used in uh, college, uh, or even in primary school. I think it was even primary school. It? So it's related it's, it's, it's to... It's used high school, so it's with a biology, well, it's like terminal... It's not biology, no, it's really it's at, a, at a much earlier and level there is that there is that they, it's it's a it's manual or something like ABC, which is... And the other reference, one cannot separate the banner of non la religion from the other one that we see here. Because the first on the left? Yes, on that image, the, the uh, Arabic uh, uh, script, uh, the other one. Because the first policies against the Thierry religion, those who took their children from school when it was supposed to be taught, were uh, Islamic mothers. This is how it's so the two. And the American reference here, I'm not sure, was that central. It's, it's more sort of Western, Occidental, decadence. So there, there is a class. What? There is also a class in it. So it's not only the Muslim families, but it's also all other families from, from, yes. from, from you know, lower, from more yes. income yes. areas. Yes. But, but the two manners the two are really. And also, from what I, I read, it's not just Paris. It's, it's, I think there's a thing in Lyon as well. No, it's not Paris. No, it's the suburbs very much of Paris. Local chapter. Local chapter. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Oh, I just wanted to say that it was, I, I believe it was a uh, biology, well, like it, uh, no. And it's been the manual for, oh, it's like, yeah, it was all, it's 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 all, it's
I think there's more than one thing. Yeah, yeah, I think there's yeah, the high school biology, but look, there's also a primary school gender. It's quite interesting. This school must be studied before the class meeting tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>